We've talked about the derivative and how it's the slope of the tangent line at any defined point along a graph. Let's go ahead and look at a graph and talk about intervals where it's increasing and decreasing. So for this particular graph, let's go ahead and look at some important points. This is an endpoint and an endpoint here as well. And this is the interval from, let's say, a to B. And this is a closed interval, meaning I have bracketed values here. Now I have lots of other things going on in between. We'll call this C, D, E, and F. Now important things are going on at these points. That's kind of why we looked at them. We know that these are called relative max, relative min, relative max, and relative min. So what I want to do is look at intervals on where the function is increasing. Now when we're talking about intervals, we want to talk about a list of x values where the function is increasing. So intervals on where the function is increasing. And so sometimes I abbreviate this and I just say an arrow up for increasing. Well if we look at this interval, we can look at this and say well it's increasing, it looks like for me, where I have positive sloping tangent lines. And then at this very point, I know that my derivative is equal to zero at all of these. So these are important points as well. And these are where that derivative is making the change from a positive to a negative sloping tangent line. So I guess when we're talking about these intervals, when I talk about the endpoint at A, at the very point A, this interval is neither increasing nor decreasing. So I would say it's increasing from A, this is a parenthesis, because at A I have a lot of different things going on here at this point. I have an infinite number of tangent lines. So it's increasing from A to C. It's also increasing from D to E. And then it increases again from F to B. Now at B, it's an open, because at closed point, it would be e neither increasing nor decreasing because I have tangent lines that could go either way at the end point, so that's why it's hollow. So let's go ahead and look at intervals where F is decreasing. Now a lot of times in my notes I'll use a shorthand notation for decreasing as arrow down. So I can see I'm decreasing from C to D, and I'm decreasing again from E to F. So these are all some important things that we can talk about intervals where we're increasing and decreasing. Now we've already looked at these ideas before, uh, but just to clarify one more time before we actually uh, start looking at some applications here and some different types of problems. Now again, I look at these because I have these positive sloping tangent lines, so this is all focusing on the tangent line. Now at this point my derivative is equal to zero, and where my derivative is equal to zero, I have the horizontal tangent line, I know I have these critical numbers occurring. So we have a lot going on with this particular graph. So I have intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing. I also have some concavity occurring here. At this point, this point, and about this point, these are called points of inflection. And at a point of inflection, a point of inflection, I have a concavity change. So when I talk about this concavity change, here I have a negative concavity because it's opening down, here I have a positive concavity because it's opening up, and here I have a negative concavity because it's opening down, and a positive concavity because it's opening up. So I'm going to have to define some new points here where I have these little asterisks, where these um, points of inflection are. So I'm going to call this point G, this point H, and this point J. So let's also look where we have positive and negative concavity. So intervals where we have positive concavity. Now we haven't really defined concavity other than to look at the picture and we can kind of inspect it. And look based on this inspection we can say it's opening down. Now notice that my derivative is positive and negative both, so I can't say it has anything to do with that first derivative, but we'll be able to tie it into the second derivative pretty shortly. So I have positive concavity from G to H, 
closed um, print the closed points at A and B, but G and H are open. And I have positive concavity again from J to B. Open intervals. So let's go ahead and look at interval where we have negative concavity. And this could be more than one value, but in this case I just have a negative interval from H to J where I have that negative concavity. So again, that concavity is that idea of whether the graph is opening up or down. It doesn't have to do with the first derivative slopes of tangent lines. But again, it kind of gives us an intuitive look at those idea of concavity, and it is important to try and tie in the idea of increasing, decreasing, and concavity. Now when I have a little bit of a discussion here about intervals where if my function is increasing, that's basically saying, where is my derivative? positive. Decreasing is saying where is my derivative negative. Now we haven't talked about this, but I'm going to put it in here too so we have a comprehensive set of notes. Positive concavity occurs where the second derivative is positive, and negative concavity occurs where the second derivative is negative. Okay, so we haven't really worked on that yet, but I want you to know what those definitions are. So when we do get to them, you'll have an, a pictorial idea of what that means. Now if I wanted to formally test to see where an interval, where I have an interval where a function is increasing and decreasing, what I do is I take a derivative, and I would take this derivative and set it equal to zero, and I'd find critical numbers, and I'd test them in a slope chart, and I'd also look to where the derivative is undefined as well. So we know how to do that from a previous section, but we'll review that in just a minute. One of the things I like about this particular section is we can be given all sorts of different f characteristics or facts about a graph, and then we'll be asked to sketch something. So sketch a continuous graph. Now this word continuous is important. That means there's no gaps, there's no hollow points that are not defined somewhere else. So there's it's continuity. I don't have vertical asymptotes. So we want to sketch a function that's continuous and we'll go over all real numbers negative to positive infinity that have the satisfied of the following conditions. So my first condition let's say something like the derivative is positive and let's put up a few different intervals. Let's go negative infinity to 0, 4 to 6 and then my last would be 6 to infinity. So second characteristic, let's say the first derivative is also negative on just the interval from 0 to 4. Okay, so this is kind of like if I did a slope chart, and these are my intervals where I had positive and negative values. Third thing, I would like a point to be undefined, so f prime of 0 is undefined. Now you might think, well, that's an asymptote, but remember it has to be a continuous function, so it can't be an asymptotic line. Fourth characteristic, it says f prime of 4 and f prime of 6, something's going on there, is equal to 0. So let's go ahead and sketch a graph of what this would look like. Now f prime of 4 and f prime of 6 equals 0, that's telling me that my, cr my critical numbers are occurring at these places. So this implies x equal 4 and x equal 6 are critical numbers. So that's interesting. Now f prime of 0 is undefined. Well, f prime of 0 being undefined, you might think, well, that means it's a hollow point. Well, remember, it has to be a continuous function. So this would be something perhaps like a cusp or a corner or a sharp point. And then f prime greater than 0 would mean I have a positive sloping tangent line on these intervals, and f prime of less than 0 would be a negative sloping tangent line. So let's go ahead and try and sketch this. Now there's more than one solution to this, but I'm just going to try and put up a basic sketch of what's going on here. Okay, so when we're trying to come up with this basic sketch, I don't really have any particular y values other than the zero that I need to be careful with here. So something's going on at four and something's going on at six. So these are important points on my graph. So here's four. 6, 
it looks like to me at 4 and 6 the derivative is equal to 0. So that's telling me I have some sort of critical number occurring there and so I might have a max or a min, something's going on. Now f prime of 0 is undefined. Okay, so here's 0. So f prime of 0 means we have a cusp or a corner. And I don't know what the y value is, I'm just going to put it right up here. But it could be down here. Um, it could even be down here if I could make it work with the rest of the graph, but I'm just going to pick this point. Now to the left of this 0, from negative infinity to 0, it says I have a positive sloping tangent line. So that means I have something come in, let's say like this. So I have positive sloping tangent line, so that's done. Now from 0 to 4, it says I have a negative sloping tangent line. Well it also says that I have a critical number occurring here, and if the slope is equal to 0, this would be maybe at this point where I'd have this cusp coming in sharp and then I'd have the negative sloping tangent lines. And then from 4 to 6, so from 4 to 6, I have a positive sloping tangent line. And then at 6, I have something else going on. I have another horizontal tangent line. So it could look something like this. And again, there's more than one graph that this could be. So let's go ahead and look back through this have y prime equals 0, have y prime equals 0, I have increasing graph from 4 to 6 and then from 6 to infinity but at 6 my slope of my tangent line is 0, I have an undefined so this is a cusp at this point and then I have decreasing from 0 to 4. So this could be one picture of what that graph would look like. And this is, a, this is something you'll be, you should be able to do as well, is to design a graph based on all of these pieces of information. Now we've already talked about a slope chart. So I have critical numbers at x equal 4, and I have a critical number at x equal 6. So what our slope chart is saying then is to the right of 6, I have a positive sloping tangent line. Between 4 and 6 I have a positive sloping tangent line. And then between 0 and 4 I have a negative sloping tangent line. But this only goes to 0. So even though this doesn't tell me that my uh, derivative is equal to 0, that piece of information is coming up where my derivative is undefined. Because remember critical points can occur two places. Now between negative infinity to 0 I have a positive sloping tangent line. So this graph has to look something just vaguely like this. So I have increasing, decreasing, and then increase, increase. Now as I go through this increase I know that I have to level off here by this piece of information. So a slope chart helps us look at that and then also our experience with graphing and knowing like the cusp is where I have a sharp point or a corner here. I have an infinite number of horizontal, or sorry, I have an infinite number of tangent lines. One could be horizontal. So I know it's not a relative max or a relative min in that way, um, but it is undefined and I could call this a relative min. I don't really have any absolute extrema that I want to look at here. And then for my particular graph, this looks also almost like an absolute max kind of hard to tell though, maybe not, looks a little higher on this endpoint. But those are some, a graph that you can draw from that type of information. So we've already talked about intervals where I'm increasing and decreasing, um, and it's important to be able to look at that slope chart and to find those critical numbers if you are given a function. Now the slope chart is also looking at something called the first derivative test. So the first derivative test basically says if there's a change in sign from negative to positive or from positive to negative, I have a relative extrema occurring there. I have a relative max or a relative min. So you can see I have my relative max and here I have my relative min. So this is the same as the first derivative test. I just like to look at it pictorially on that number line because it gives me a nice idea of what's going on with my function. So this has been a review so far except for the bit about concavity. So that's what I want to focus in more is concavity. Now when we talk about concavity up above we also talked about points of inflection. Now points of inflection 
I often abbreviate PI, so if you see PI in your notes, points of inflection, it's where we have a change in concavity. So let's go ahead and look at a graph again and then talk about concavity changes. This is a nice little graph. We can see we have increasing, decreasing, increasing if we want to talk about um, the slopes of the tangent lines. And we can see something is important happening here. But in terms of concavity, this is the important point. This is where I switch from negative concavity, the graph is opening down, to positive concavity where the graph is opening up. So this point right here, the point A, so x equal A is a point of inflection. This is where I have a concavity change. Well, what's happening here is this has to do with the second derivative. So this is the original function. And then I could start talking about the derivative of this function, which tells me about intervals where I'm increasing and decreasing. And then I can start talking about concavity. And that has to do with the derivative of the first derivative or the second derivative. So if the second derivative is positive, is, that means greater than zero on some interval, then I, sa then I say that it has positive concavity. If the second derivative is less than zero on an interval, Then I say that it has negative concavity. So negative concavity because the second derivative will be negative, positive concavity because the second derivative will be positive. So if I have this sign change occurring, that basically tells me where I have a point of inflection. So I have a concavity change. So those are the things that we want to look at when we're talking about concavity. Now these points of inflections also occur at critical numbers. And let's look at a few graphs that might help us look at that. We already know about positive and negative concavity from up above. Now notice for this particular graph, this graph always has positive concavity. And you might look at that and say, well, wait a minute, I have negative and positive. Those are slopes of the tangent line. So sometimes people look at this point and we think, oh, something is important is happening here. But that's not an inflection point because there's no concavity change. So something is important here at this particular point. The second derivative at this point C is equal to zero, but it's not an inflection point because the concavity doesn't change. And that's a big idea. So it's not an inflection point because the concavity doesn't change. It's a, probably going to be a critical number that I have to test in a concavity chart, but it's not going to end up being a point of inflection because I do not have a concavity change. Let's go ahead and look at another example. And this is a graph that we've looked at several times. It's kind of this S-shaped graph. So here I have negative concavity. Here I have positive concavity. So that exact point where the concavity changes, and we'll call this point C again, that is an inflection point. So F double prime of C does not exist. Okay, be, and we say it doesn't exist because basically you have a tangent line right here that's vertical. Okay, so f prime, f double prime at c does not exist. The second derivative does not exist at this point. But I do have a concavity change. And because I have this cavity change, therefore, c, x equals c, is a point of inflection. Remember, pi is point of inflection. So that's interesting. So even though that this is undefined, and we say it's undefined here because, or it doesn't exist either one, because my tangent line is going to be vertical there. Let's go ahead and look at another example.
Now for this one, I have negative concavity. And then over here on this side, I also have negative concavity. So this F double prime at C does not exist. So C is not a point of inflection because there's no concavity change. Okay, let's go ahead and look at another example. Um, we did, oh, I'm sorry, that's not negative concavity, that's positive concavity on both sides. We could do one with negative concavity as well. So I have negative concavity. And this value of C, F double prime at C does not exist. So it's not a point of inflection because I don't have a concavity change. So these are I important things to be looking at. Now, when we're looking at intervals where we're increasing and decreasing, that provides information, but you can see on some of these graphs, I'm constantly increasing. This graph is constantly increasing, yet I have a concavity change. I have a critical number here where that concavity is changing. So I'm not necessarily looking for a change in whether my function is increasing or decreasing. I'm specifically looking for that idea of concavity. And that idea of concavity means I have a function who's increasing or decreasing, those tangent lines are changing. And in fact, if we think about it, it's basically talking about the first derivative is increasing on an, on an interval. So it's concaves up, but I, that could also have a first derivative that is getting lower and lower, but is still positive. And so that would have to do with negative concavity. So again, you have to be really careful about how you interpret that. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at a problem where we're given a function, and based on this function, we're asked to find something about its concavity. Now again, concavity are related to points of inflection where I have a concavity change. Now these points of inflection are, can occur in two places. One, where the second derivative is equal to zero, or two, where the second derivative is undefined. So that's what I want to kind of keep in mind here while I'm working. So let's go ahead and look at a function. Um, let's look at f of x. Let's look at a polynomial function. Let's look at 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed. This should be easy to take the derivative of. Minus 6x squared plus 12x plus 1. And what I want to do, um, I would like to look at the intervals on which the function is concave up, concave down, and find inflection points. So I want to know where this is concave up, concave down, and points of inflection. Remember, points of inflection can only occur where I have a change in concavity. So to get started, let's go ahead and look at our first derivative. That would be 12x cubed minus 12x squared minus 12x plus 12. I see this common theme of 12s here. So that's interesting that that's my first derivative, but we also need to find my second derivative because that's really what I want to get to for concavity. So if I wanted to, I could set this equal to zero, the first derivative and solve and find critical numbers and then look at uh, relative maxes and mins, but I want to just get to concavity. So my second derivative, bring the three down, would be 36x squared minus 24x minus 12. Now this is a polynomial function, so my um, po possible points of infect inflection will only occur where this is equal to zero. I don't need to worry about where it's undefined. Let's go ahead and factor out that 12. And again, this is my second derivative. I don't want to drop any notation. So I have 3x squared minus 2x minus 1. Now my hope is, is this will factor. And so this should factor into 3x and x. And then this has to be a 1 and a 1. And to make this work, it should be, these should be my signs. So dividing through by 12, we have 3x plus 1 equals 0, or x minus 1 equals 0. So I'd subtract 1 and divide by 3, and I get x equal negative 1 third. And over here, I'd add 1 to both sides, and I'd get x equal 1. 
So therefore, x equal negative one-third and x equal one are my critical numbers. But I'm going to call them possible points of inflection here. But they're the critical numbers of my second derivative. So they're also called critical numbers of the second derivative. So we have critical numbers for our first and critical numbers for our second. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these in a concavity chart. A concavity chart's like a slope chart. It's just a number line. And I'm going to check to see what's going on with my concavity in each of these little intervals. I can choose any number in the interval, so like two, zero, let's say, and negative one. Now I want to check these in the second derivative, so I'm coming up here to plug these in. So if I plug in a two, the twelve is always positive, so I don't care. If I plug a two in here, I get positive. A two in here, I get positive. So I have all positive values. If I plug in a zero, I get positive, negative. Positive times a negative is a negative. And if I plug in a negative one, I'd have a negative times a negative, which is a positive. So my concavity is positive, negative, positive. And because I have this change in concavity, this is a point of inflection. And this is a point of inflection as well. Because again, I have that change in concavity. So two points of inflection. So I have points of inflection. Now sometimes in your homework they'll just ask for the point, the x values, and sometimes they'll ask for an ordered pair. If they just ask for the x values, that's all you need to list, but if they want the ordered pairs, I would take the x value and I'd plug it back into my original and that would give me the corresponding y value. So these are my points of inflection. Now this is an exaggerated positive concavity. This could be um, just a very slight positive concavity. I don't know what's going on for sure here. But when I'm looking at my uh, concavity chart, I like to kind of over-exaggerate the change in concavity just to make it clear what's going on. So as the slope chart is synonymous with the first derivative test, the concavity chart is similar, similar to talking about the second derivative test. However, the second derivative test gives us a little bit more information. So let's go ahead and write about the second derivative test. And again, I like to use slope charts and concavity charts. I don't necessarily like to use the second derivative test so much, but I'll show you what it is because you are going to be happy you know about it. So what the second derivative test says is that you have a continuous second derivative. So suppose the second derivative is continuous. And we know something about the critical numbers from the first derivative. So it's continuous on an open interval. And the open interval means I have parentheses, not brackets at the endpoints. So I could go from negative to positive infinity, for instance. And this open interval is containing C with the first derivative evaluating at c would equal to zero. So basically what that's saying is c is a critical number of my first derivative. And we'll be specific when we look at an example. So if I take my second derivative and I evaluate it at that critical number and I get something that's positive, that means I have positive concavity, this implies a local min of my graph at C. If I take my second derivative and I evaluate it and I get a negative number, that means I have negative concavity, so I'll have a local maximum at C. Now we've said if it's positive, we said if it's negative, what if I take my second derivative and I plug in a C and I get zero? Then, I can't say if it's a local max or a local min, it's an inconclusive test. And if it's inconclusive, it could have a local max, it could have a local min, or it could be neither. And the only way I can figure that out then is by my 
uh, concavity chart. So I just like to go to the concavity chart right away. Could have a local max or a relative max, however you want to say that. A local min or neither. I have to check the point in a concavity chart. And not even necessarily checking that exact point, but taking the second derivative, finding possible points of inflection, and checking from there. So let's go ahead and run through a problem where we're trying to find um, our extrema using the second derivative test. So we've already looked at this function. So find relative or local extrema. We use these interchangeably. And again, let's using the second derivative test. And let's use our function f of x equals, and let's use that function we did before because we were familiar with its derivatives. So let's do 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 12x plus 1. And we could look at it, we could look at an interval. Let's look at the interval from negative 2 to 2. So the first thing we want to do is to find critical numbers. So if we take our derivative, we have f prime of x equals 12x cubed minus 12x squared minus 12x plus 12. And if we set this equal to 0, uh, this factors into 12x squared times x minus 1. Factor out a negative 12x minus 1. And I'm left with x minus 1. This is factoring by grouping. 12x squared minus 12. And then I have a 12 that's in common, so I can pull the 12 out front. And I'm left with x squared minus 1. And of course that factors into x plus 1, x minus 1 equals 0. And if I set each of these equal to 0, I get critical numbers occur at x equal negative 1 from here and positive 1 from here. And of course the 12 I just divide through and I don't worry about that. So that's my first derivative. I have critical points and I'm going to take these critical numbers and plug them into my second derivative. But first we need to find the second derivative. So let's look at the second derivative. And I don't want to take the second derivative from this. That would be really ugly. I'd have like a triple product rule. I'm just going to take my second derivative from this first polynomial expression. So that was 36x squared, and we did that up above in another problem, minus 24x minus 12. So I'm going to plug in my critical numbers. I'm going to plug in negative 1, and I'm going to plug in positive 1. So these critical numbers get plugged in over here. Well, if I plug in a negative one, and again, we really only care whether it's positive or negative. We can find an exact value, but it doesn't end up really mattering. I have 36 plus 24 minus 12. That's going to be positive. That's a positive number. And again, that's 36 plus, because I have a negative 24 times a negative one, uh, minus 12. That's positive. If I plug in a 1, I have 36 minus 24. 36 minus 24, I have to be careful of this one, is 12. And 12 minus 12 is 0. So this equals 0. So because this is greater than 0, that tells me I have positive concavity of some sort. And so that means at this point, because I have this positive concavity, so positive concavity, That means I have a relative minimum point. Okay, so my relative minimum is at negative 1. And I could plug in the negative 1 to my original, which is clear up here, to find my y value if I wanted to. And I think we did that at one time. I I'm, don't remember for sure, but you could look back and find that y value if you wanted. Now because my second derivative evaluated my critical point here was equal to 0, this is inconclusive. 
that means you have to do more work. Now because this shows up often enough that we're going to have to use um, a concavity chart, a lot of times I like to skip the second derivative test and just do the concavity chart anyway. So the more work that I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a slope chart. Because remember, we're trying to find maxes and min. So our slope chart gives us information about relative max and relative min. So here's my slope chart. Now, negative one and one are my values. I already know what's happening at negative one. I have positive concavity, so I have a relative min. So I already know that this is going on for my second derivative test, but we can, we can double check it. Oops, zero's not to the left of there. Let's try negative two. Zero's between and positive two. Now remember, I'm plugging these into the first derivative, so they would plug in up here. So if I plug in a negative two just to check my work, I have a positive times a negative times a negative, which is a positive times a negative would be another negative. That works. If I plug a zero in here, I get a positive 12 back out, so this is positive. Let's plug a positive 2 in and see what I get. And I'm plugging them into each of these and I'm checking to see if they're positive or negative and then looking at their product. So I have a positive times a positive times a positive times a positive, which is definitely a positive. So this is continually increasing. So I don't have a slope change here. So I do have my relative min here, which I already found up here for my second derivative test. But there's no change here, so what's happening is I do not have a relative max or a relative min at x equal 1. So not a relative max, not a relative min. So you kind of might wonder what's going on here, and it's probably implying that I have a change in concavity, but I won't know that until I do a slope chart. Let's go ahead and graph this. Now these are long problems. So you kind of have to stick with them. So let's go ahead and look at our graph of 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 12x plus 1. And again, we just want to look at the graph might have to change our window. Something's going on down here. I want to go further down on the x and the y and then higher up as well. So I'm going to go negative 10 to 10 on my x. And again, you can adjust these to all sorts of different um, viewing windows. I'm just choosing one that I think will work pretty good here. And then on my y min, um, let's go down to let's say negative 10. But my y back max, I think it's going up pretty high. It was pretty steep. So my y max, let's go something like, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, something like that. Okay, here comes the graph. Okay, so this is interesting. I'm going to change my window again. I'm going to switch this to negative 5 to 5 because I kind of want to widen that scale out so I can get a good look at this. It's going to come down, switch, and that shows me perfectly what's going on there. I'm going to go a little bit lower on my y min. And the reason I want to go a little lower, I'm pretty sure that that's a, a point and it turns, but that graph cut it off just a bit. So there's my graph. And everything I found out about that graph so far matches with what my handwork has been. Now we talked about the interval negative 2 to 2, I believe, on this. And that's not necessarily my huge focus here. But I can see what's happening is I have a relative min here. Now it's also an absolute min, but I wasn't checking for absolute extreme. I'm just looking for relative min here. And then at this point 1, remember if you look back at our slope chart, I had negative 1 and positive 1. See I have positive, positive sloping tangent lines? That's telling me that I have a change in concavity, so positive to positive sloping tangent lines. But that's not a relative max or a min. So this is that point that's neither max nor min. OK, 
Okay, so again, I have a change in concavity here though. In my concavity chart, I think that we did up above, we did the same function. I had a concavity chart, and from that concavity chart, my concavity went positive, negative, positive. And if we come down and look at the graph, we can see that my concavity goes positive, and then it switches right in here to negative, and it switches back to positive. Now that value where it's switched, I can go find on my concavity chart. And that was at negative one-third and one. So I have that change in concavity. So that change in concavity occurred at negative one-third, so maybe right in here somewhere at x equal negative one-third. And my change in concavity here was at this point, x equal one. So you can work these problems with trig functions. You can um, do the first and second derivative of your trig functions and work from there as well. And being able to find these first and second derivatives and then being able to interpret and find relative and absolute maxes and mins will be important. As usual, if you have questions, please let me know. You can send a snapshot, text me a snapshot of your work. You can also use Pearson Connect, of course, and then I also have the option now where we can get together online and work on a common whiteboard. And then from the common whiteboard, we can also have a conversation and we have audio, uh, unlike the Pearson Connect. So if you want to give that a try, send me a text and let's see if we can find a time that works for both of us where we can set that up. As usual, good luck.